Are you ready to turn your best ideas into a thriving online business? Introducing Shopify, your no excuses business partner. You might not realize, but our podcast, More Than Mammies, it's a business. And we started it, of course, to talk about maternity, not to become an e-commerce expert. So yeah, we needed some help selling our merch and getting our store up and running. Another sale. Shopify is a commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. No matter if you are a garage entrepreneur or a big business, Shopify is the only tool you need to start and grow your business without the struggle. With Shopify single dashboard, you can manage orders, shipping, and payments from anywhere, giving you the insights you need wherever you are. Sign up for $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash sonoro or lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash sonoro to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash sonoro. Welcome to episode 81 of the Brown and Black Podcast. My name is Jack Rico. And I'm Mike Sargent. And every week we take a look at race and pop culture through a brown and black lens. Coming out of the television industry, Mike, and it's one that affects us brown and black people, which is that DeSeuss and Mero are done at Showtime. We should make the set look like intake at Rikers. Right, we'll right. spray you down. Give you one phone call. We'll be like, up next, Hillary Clinton. Uh, yeah. Check this out. Ooh, these are nice. Who you like to have on the show? First guest, Kim's new baby, in utero interview. Who's doing that in late night? Nobody. They're done. They're going their separate ways. Late night looks less diverse today than it has. I wasn't a huge fan of the Seuss and Mero, but I have been following their career since the Bodega Boys because it was a podcast that was just really funny. There's been stuff going on and, and we should probably break down what happened. So why don't you just give us a breakdown of what went down? Well, first of all, let me just say this. What was interesting about Jesus and Miro is that, you know, it's Afro-Latino. It's brown and black. It's it's kind of what we do. And we paid attention to it, I think, because it's sort of in our lane. We're, we're, we're in a similar lane in that we have similar sensibilities in terms of what we bring to the table. But what I understand, Jesus, who is actually named Daniel Baker, and Miro, whose real name is Joel Martinez, they had a producer manager named Victor Lopez. Lopez was an asshole and he was such an asshole and had so much, let's just say, was so full of assholery that Showtime asked him to stop coming to tapings of the show because he was bullying and screaming and, and they actually had complaints filed. Let me just pause here to say there are a lot of people who kind of come up with someone who's able to take them into a certain level. And then, you know, we've heard those stories, especially in music where like that manager who was real, let's just say ghetto or from the hood or whatever that helps you get to a certain point can't take you further because they can't be in the room with the kind of people you need, or they don't have the temperament or a whole number of things. So this happens. Problem is that Jesus sided with Showtime and Miro sided with Lopez. Loyalty, professionalism, vision, it's a whole lot of things. But now they're, they're done. The, the real question then is, what are the consequences of not having them, people of color on late night now? Is this a blow to like late night? Is, is this a blow to the culture? Because there was also a bunch of fans and to see them individually, I'm not exactly sure 
if it's the same attraction, it's the same, you know, marquee attraction. Who you see on late night, it's usually a bunch of white guys. And it's been that way for a really long time. So even when women are there, they're there for a while and they're short lived. They just canceled Samantha B, who I never watched anyway, even though it was on for 12 years. But so, yeah, I do think it affects. I think it affects the fact that, you know, there isn't representation late at night. Like late at night, you're not going to see us. I mean, look, we have Amber Ruffin, who's on NBC, but these aren't you know, prime time late night shows, uh, so to speak. These are really late, 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 late night shows that don't register much in the mainstream pop culture, national conversation, the way the Susan Merrow, the Susan Merrow were definitely the outliers in the late night format in the United States. I think part of what makes them special is that they're, dude, just like real street kids that kind of, brown and black that had this incredible chemistry and that catapulted because of their that chemistry and, and the humor that came out of that chemistry to create this explosion in a very urban setting which had not late night is really not known for at all so if anything the susan marrow was this successful outlier experiment that worked. I don't, I'm not sure if it's going to be able to be replicated. You know, I think the next big wave is going to be something completely different. That isn't them. Dude, there's no way it can be replicated. How, how many decades do we hear the next Siskel and Ebert? I was just going to say that <laughs> the <just>, same example. <laughs> there's, ne- <laughs> there's never been, there never will be. But you know, what's interesting. I think about Hey, Susan Merrill is that once again, Uh, we, and I say we brown and black folks, we are always redefining cool. We are always what is hip. If you want to be a hip white boy, you talk like being black or being a person of color. If you want, you listen to that music, you listen to hip hop or reggaeton, you know, that is it. So once again, they, you know, nobody else is on late night with a hat on, <laughs> you know, with uh, not wearing a suit, you know, just casual, just being themselves. And talking like a homeboy. And talking like a homeboy. And and just being real, okay? It's fun to watch, I guess, any of these late night hosts cut up with stuff that's written for them by their writers. It's a very different thing to have just two guys who live around the corner from you and you're in their living room talking. Right, right. Um, my next question is because it's so obvious that the, the the recurring theme about this whole breakup is loyalty. <laughs> and I w- wanted to ask you if you think, Mike, is is too much loyalty bad for business? Because, listen, we got the ethical and we got the moral thing. We grew up that we got to be loyal, loyal to our mother. That's how it begins. We got to be loyal to our, our mother, our father, our family members, our friends, our neighborhoods, our coworkers, our bosses. We got to be loyal to the max on every single thing. But what do we know about loyalty in the world, Mike? It's a myth. It's a myth because loyalty is what got these guys into trouble. And by the way, let me read the definition of loyalty because I thought it was pretty interesting. Giving or showing firm and constant support or allegiance to a person or institution. Let me repeat that. Giving or showing firm and constant support or allegiance to a person or institution. So he's doing the right thing when it comes to loyalty per the dictionary definition. He's like, yo, If that means that I got to break this up for loyalty, wow. I mean, talk about textbook loyalty. And not only that, you got to tip your hat to the guy as loyalty person of the year. Like Time Magazine should do, put him on the cover and instead of person of the year, say loyal person of the decade, of the century. I mean, these guys are essentially a franchise they're they're intellectual property they're a brand and that could have been growing and growing and left millions and millions of dollars that they could have given to their you know grandkids their kids their 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 generations to come but you break that up for loyalty and mike i'm just saying in america in america 
Was that a bad move? Well, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate with you, Jack Rico, because yes, I think there is clearly a lot to be said for loyalty and for him to be loyal to this this manager. This manager got them wherever they were, and they probably feel they owe their career to them. But as, as an individual, as an adult, yes, you can be loyal, but you know it's only one layer of loyalty because loyalty, that adherence to, you said, an institution, I also think to, to ideals, to, to who you are, to who you are, okay? Now, to, to one of them being loyal to the person that put them there, even if that person is an asshole, even if that person turns other people off, even if that person has done wrong in the eyes of others, they are loyal to them. But the other person is loyal maybe to other uh, uh, principles. Maybe they're loyal to people being respected. Maybe they're loyal to themselves and a career that is not tied to someone who is creating a bad reputation for themselves. Well, a soldier to, to, to the United States government military complex, killing people left and right everywhere in the world, you're being loyal and that's what I'm saying. Is loyalty a myth? Is loyalty a self-construct? Is, is, what does is loyalty really mean, Mike? Well, again, you just answered it. Is loyalty a self-construct? Of course it is, because even whatever your definition of loyalty is, it's, it's what you're committed to, what you believe in. That's what your loyalty, your code of ethics, your, 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 the way it is, like a friend to the end. You know, bros and that before. can change with the wind. Now you're getting to something else. Because you say, uh, I, I say, yes, it's self uh, created, but now we're getting to content of character. Okay. Content, the content of your character will decide. You say the wind blows with the wind, the wind will blow, but the content of your character says what you will do when that wind blows. Correct. That's what I agree with. It's that not something that I feel is represented as a common thing of loyalty in society. Mike, you're going to tell me that you don't have some story of a coworker or a boss that promised you something in return for loyalty and then as soon as he jumped ship, you didn't go with him or something along. We've seen this in movies. We see this in TV series. Hasn't Shakespeare written about this? We've seen the disloyalty in every great story you've ever heard of. Judas is probably the biggest disloyalty ever done all right but you're bringing up another factor here the other factor is perspective okay from the perspective you could on one hand you could say this person is loyal and the other person's perspective is uh they're betraying the brand they're betraying what we have together and you're being loyal to him but not to us okay so it's a perspective that who exactly who's right to me, I, again, it's all a matter of perspective. And then it, it, to me, at the end of the day, if you can sleep with, if you feel you've done the right thing, then you've been loyal to yourself and that you've done. You're right. You're right. At the end of the day, right. he has to sleep with himself right. and has some sort of peace of mind that he did the right move. And for him, that was exactly. the right move, but that wasn't necessarily the right move for the brand. The brand is over, right? It, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Because of loyalty. And the brand didn't do anything wrong to deserve that. The Seuss necessarily didn't deserve that, or the whole team that got fired didn't necessarily disturb that. So does the principle outweigh the the damage done to other people? Maybe loyalty is an altruistic thing. It's, maybe it's a very individual thing, but the altruism no longer exists in any way if other people are hurt by your loyalty. You'd rather take out a whole team of 30. Supposed to one guy? Well, let yeah, I agree. All the people who were part of that brand, part of that show, they all lost work because of that lo his loyalty to them. But l let's look at it this way: you can remain loyal and split up. The best example would be Key and Peel. Now they were loyal; they had a brand, but then eventually they both outgrew that. And they went on to other things. Right. But that was a creative growth that was happening. That's not what's happening here. There was a, this is the Yoko Ono thing, man. There's always mm. like a partner or associate or something along those lines that comes through and it creates a wedge in between the group or in this case, the duo. And it was him. Here's what Victor could have said. Yo, man, listen. I'm not going to break you guys up. I'm not going to be the one that breaks up the Beatles, you know? 
uh, I'm not going to be the one that does that and then have to live with that burden and then allow you to do it. No, 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 no that, that's not for me. Clearly, it sounds like he was OK with the breakup because this dude probably had beef with DeSeuss and maybe DeSeuss's crew. And he just rather sink the ship and move forward than have the ship continue without him in it. And I just think that that's extremely egocentric if that's how it played out, man. Well, I think we'll read a lot into it, but I will say this. I mean, considering the fact that they both have other things going on, okay? But as big as both of them together, I mean, we'll never know. I know, but, you know. Until we live it. Who knows if Victor's saying, hey, man, you'll be bigger than ever. You don't need him. You know, who knows? I mean, there's a lot that could have happened because, to me, this is kind of a classic scenario, like you said where one this manager is the problem it's like it's like the the stage mom everybody wants to work with the the child actor but that stage mom but no one can deal with the manager manager. (laughs) i mean wasn't this the same issue look and luis miguel suffered from that from Mm -hmm. uh, his life his his father was his manager and then after that there was another manager that they were all just exploiting the poor guy for his money. There's so many stories about the bad manager. And the question is, is Victor Lopez the bad manager? Only time will tell. Well, the other interesting story that we were going to discuss here is just the whole idea of selling an IP, an intellectual property, selling something that you then no longer own. We've all heard the famous story of James Cameron selling the Terminator and they went off to make Terminator films without him. Uh, And then finally he came back. Uh, But still, he doesn't own the property. But the most classic or most iconic story of someone selling a property waiting to get the right deal waiting to them to actually be in this script that they wrote is the story of sylvester stallone sylvester stallone was you know an actor who had done some bit parts and and, you know had written this script and people wanted to make it but nobody wanted to allow him to play the lead until he met Erwin Winkler. And Erwin Winkler bought the property, made the film, Rocky, the rest is history. But it's been 42 years. 42 years. They've made multiple Rockies. They've made Creed movies. Erwin Winkler, in his 90s now, is still the owner of the property. Stallone gets a piece of the action of something he created, but he doesn't own it. And he's been talking about getting his rights back because think about this. Stallone now is in his 70s and he'd like to leave something for his kids. Rocky is something that may be recast, retold years later, just like any other classic story. But Mike, story. this was a legal move. This was done with lawyers. It was done with his consent. He was okay with it. He's made a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars off of the Rocky franchise. Might not have gotten the back end. But he definitely got the front end of all that cash, popularity, relevancy to continue making them, you know, and solidified Rocky Balboa as one of the greatest characters in movie history. So it's not like the guy has not been compensated. But here's the question, Mike. Let's leave morality and and ethics out of this. Is Stallone legally right to ask for that franchise cut back or is Erwin Winkler in all of his right to not give him shit. Well, I, I think this legality has nothing to do with it I, at this point. I think it's really principle. You know, the question is, in principle, it's and I was incorrect, it's not 42 years, 47 years. In principle, after you've made money on somebody else's property, on somebody else's idea for 50 years, and you're 93, okay, um, and he's asking for it back, He's asking for the property back before you before die. Before you die, so that he can leave it. So it won't. So he can leave it to yeah, his and, and, ancestors. 
That's the question. Yes, that's the, question. the thing. I've read a lot of this, and the question is, you're Rocky Balboa, and you're looking at the future of the rights. So in some way, I think it would be fair, but not legal, but, but fair. To say, listen, man, you and I agreed that you were going to sell me this and that at that time, that was the right decision, but you knew that I would own this in perpetuity. And you said yes. So for you to have it while I'm living, not cool. You made a lot of money. I'm making maybe a little bit more than you are. Regardless, we're both well off. It's a win-win situation. But I think what Stallone is saying is like, okay, but what if you're no longer alive and I still am? Don't you think that the transfer of power of those rights, instead of going to your kids, which you did not earn, except on a lucky day in a desperate moment in my life, that not should define a generation or generations of your Winkler family, but that that the character, me, what I put into it, the soul that I put into Rocky Balboa and the money that I have delivered and the promotion behind it, that I am, I act like I own the rights. Don't you think that if you pass away, that should come to me and not as an inheritance that someone like your kids did not earn from me? Well, I think what Stallone is really saying is, why you, why you want to take my IP from me, huh? No, why you want to take my IP from me, huh? Who am I, some kind of bum? All right, no, I mean... <laughs> that I mean, could be the thing. That could be exactly. Groot. That could be, like... That could be... <laughs> why, why won't you take my IP? Uh, oh, man. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's a tough call. I mean... As a producer, you know, playing devil's advocate, as a producer, that's my job. My job is to find properties that I can exploit and 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 create and make into movies. You couldn't make this into a movie. You you this script could still be sitting in your pocket 47 years later and you could still be a bit actor or you could have met me and I believed in you. I cast you in the freaking movie. You you've you've gone on to have a great career for the last 5 decades and uh you know, sorry you created other stuff, You've right? Done other stuff. No, I mean, I'm not saying I agree with him, but I can see that point. The whole premise of his Instagram post that it has now been recently deleted, Mike. I'm not sure if you know that. Uh, so it must have caused a ruckus, and someone said, "Look, if you really want the damn IP, that's not a good way to get it." So oh. you might have just pissed them off, and I don't know if you're probably going to even get it. Regardless. So what Stallone here is saying is, as long as you're alive, keep the IP. But if you pass away, let me keep it. And I think that this is a lesson in whether an artist, a creator, should sell their IP or not. It's always a 50-50 risk. So for example, I believe Kate Bush, I think she owns her IP. Her songs are hers. She owns the publishing rights. And so what does owning your publishing rights mean? It means that if your song or your show or your film or your product or your anything is a hit, then you could probably make the amounts of millions of dollars. Last I heard, it was $2.3 million that Kate Bush made off of the royalties of running up that hill from Stranger Things. It's already surpassed 100 million YouTube views, and that's money coming off of that. So, Mike, what should a creator do? Sell their IP? Well, here's the thing. There's the trade-off, and that's that's the interesting thing. I mean, music it has some very complicated ways. You have your rights. You have your, your publishing rights. You have your mechanical rights. You have all these different things. But sometimes you have to make a deal that's not great to, to open the door for you to make better deals. You know, no one's ever going to cut Stallone out of something he created it again. You know, but he had to do it to, to get in the door. Now, for as for musicians, you know, I mean, we all know, you know, David Bowie changed the game in terms of, you know, having your catalog and selling your catalog and things like that. But as a person of color, I'm keenly aware of a lot of the music that black creators created, they did not own the rights to. You know who owns all the rights to James Brown's music? James Brown. No, Mick Jagger. So... 
All I'm saying is well, that doesn't Michael Jackson own the Beatles catalog? Well, for a while he owned part of part of it and, and he ended up selling it back to Paul. But I'm just saying. So but again, those are famous examples of where you don't own the rights to your own work. You know, something you created is going on as a commercial property. It's an entity, it's an IP, it's it's existing, it's generating money for somebody, but not you. So mm-hmm. that that's the thing about knowing the value of the ideas, but that's a slippery slope. Because you can think your yeah, idea is so good, you don't want to show it to anybody, and you you try and get people to sign an NDA, and nobody's going to sign an NDA, and you're not anybody. You know, it's it's a sign of an amateur when you, when you make them sign an NDA and all that stuff. But again, it, it's a tough call because as an artist, you are hoping your art will open the door for you to be able to create more. But at the same time, are you having to sell your soul down the river to do it? How often can you win the lottery, Mike? Isn't the lottery now at a billion dollars? True, but I, I, I... But you're buying every day, buying every day, nah, buying how... See, are you going to be the one to win the lottery? First of all, you're talking to the wrong person. Is that happening every day? I never buy. I never play the lottery. I don't believe in wow. the lottery. I never gamble. Because I believe it's a different kind it's of lottery. It's a mathematical equation. Yeah, but I don't buy any of that. I believe you should bet on yourself. I think Albert Ruddy... He, like Aaron Judge. Like Albert Ruddy. He created Hogan's Heroes, but that wasn't enough. That opened the door for him to do other things, but then he went on to do The Godfather. He's still alive. He's still making stuff. He he, he did a Clint Eastwood movie a couple of years ago. So to me, yeah, it does suck. But if you believe in yourself, you have to believe that the well is not going to go dry. Okay. So let me ask you this. How often have you met people that believed in themselves and the world was just not going to give them what they wanted. Again, it's a slippery slope because you can believe in yourself, you can get screwed on your first deal and and never get another deal. It can happen. Here's the issue, man. From everything I understand, the business of whether you sell your property or not is about are you going to be able to make it in this industry or not? And everybody should go in with, of course, I'm going to make it into the industry or not. But then I look at all the the horror stories of all the musicians, all the creators, all the people that worked and just there were other people that were better or they were more likable or they were more charming. And then you notice that it's not necessarily skill or talent that got you there. It's likability. It's relationships. It's a lottery, whether you make it or not. Yes. I I mean, this is, we could do a whole podcast on just this topic. Like you said, it is a crapshoot. It it is a a lottery, but you'd rather spend your life trying to achieve what you want than spend it wishing you had. I just feel it's a, it was a win, win situation. Erwin believed in him when no one else did. You know, the story that was his guardian angel at the time. And he made a promise Isn't that loyalty? So, yeah, I I mean, we're talking about loyalty, right? Where's the loyalty to his word at that moment? So to now say, well, you know, I want it now, maybe while he's alive. I don't know, man. Is that the slow you're loyal? I mean, it's a very complicated thing. It is, but I will say this. You know, that first, it's like your first album, your, your first project that you sell, your first major creation, your first hit single, that first thing, you've put your life into it, your life's blood, you know, you know, you, 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 you know, you sold your dog, you know, to, to, to live, to eat just because you believed in this, this project, it does stick in your craw that you don't own it or that, that you're not, you're only getting a tiny piece. But what if he never sees the light of day, Mike? Yeah, but here's what I was going to say. But it's hard for me to feel sorry for Stallone. Because it's not not like Stallone. It's not like you don't have everything you want, dude. It was a win-win. It was a win-win. And so for Stallone to feel like, oh, damn it, I should have made more money. Uh, It just... (laughs) Well, you want to kick me out and keep my IP, huh? Uh, uh, bum. All right, so that's <laughs> that's just what I think. I think Stallone took it down for a reason. Yeah. Because he realized. He, re- he, he realized. Him. Yeah. Of course. He, regret- of course. he knows. He knows. He's like, yeah, listen, man, don't be disloyal to it. And the guy's 93. He's about to die. Let's talk about it later. Not while he's yeah. alive. And then, like, knife, tongue, serpents. 
that just sounds greedy to me yeah i was gonna say it's not like you don't have bazillion dollars to leave to your kids you, they'll, they'll be okay The very first assembly of photographs to create a motion picture was a two-second clip of a black man on a horse. And that man is my great-great-grandfather. Great. There's another great-grandfather. But that's why back at the Haywood Ranch, as the only black-owned horse trainers in Hollywood, we like to say since the moment pictures could move, we had skin in the game. It's a bad miracle. They got worth for that. Yeah, nah, nah, nah. heard is the trailer for probably one of the most talked about films of the year and that is jordan peele's nope i saw nope and i wanted to really like it i will say that there's a lot of wait wait so you didn't like it let me finish yes i i I, i'm gonna tell you what i think i'll tell you what i liked okay now if you know the premise of nope it's about these uh these horse ranchers that work in the film industry and their descendants they're sort of hollywood royalty and something strange is happening on the farm And they decide they're going to try and capture it on camera and to potentially sell the footage. Now, the conceit, the idea of what's actually out there, what is this alien force? What is it? Is it a flying saucer? What is it? That's probably one of the most original things. and 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 it's enjoyable. It's a little bit scary. It's a little bit interesting. It's it takes into account a lot of things we've heard about UFOs. I like all that. The fact that, of course, that it's a it's a cast of color, a black male lead, black female lead, a, a Latino as, as a secondary character. I, I enjoy all of that. There's some history in there. I like the history. The cinematography is brilliant. There's lots of good setups and a lot of good ideas in this movie. But for me, it just never quite comes together. It needed a rewrite. There are a lot of things that I have issues with character motivations. There are characters who just they just don't make any sense. There are things a character will say they're broke and then they'll spend thousands of dollars on something. And I just don't get it. I don't buy it. There's no explanation for it. There are things and characters that come in for me that are the convenience of plot. Now, I say all this to say that it's an enjoyable film and it's definitely worth seeing, but it didn't come together the way I wanted it to. And I was reminded of M. Night Shyamalan where there's a lot of setup. There are a lot of good ideas going on. And this does remind you, 
and and Jordan Peele says he has it was an inspiration. It will remind you a bit of Signs, which I think was probably the last good M. Night Shyamalan film before he really went down the tubes, though I hear old was good, but I didn't. Yeah. See yeah it. And so was Devil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw Devil. So I think he's having a bit of a he's, renaissance. He's having a bit of a renaissance, but he was in a rut for a while. So I don't yeah. think Jordan Peele is there because he's definitely in Spielberg territory and he definitely turn some things on their head. There are a lot of things to like here, but it needed a rewrite for me. Mike, if you're telling me you needed a rewrite from the writer and creator, then I'm starting to, well, here's a question. Is Jordan Peele the real deal? Oh, I think he's a real deal, but I also think that, like, how long did he have Get Out? He had to Get Out for a really long time. He had a lot of time to work on it, but now he's in the machine. Now he's got to keep creating content. Now he's producing Twilight Zone and doing this, and he's got another movie, and he's producing it. So is his writing suffering because of it? I would only say that there's a lot of care went into this movie, a lot of attention to detail, but there are still elements that are fun, interesting, but they don't go anywhere. They, I feel like some of his his background as, a, as a, a, a short, you know, he did all these skits with Peel and Key. He did these skits with Peel and Key. There's some things in there that are like, huh, that's an interesting, weird, huh, leaves you thinking, but then they don't connect. It, it was, it, it's fun. It's interesting. It's imaginative, but it doesn't really work with, and it could have with a rewrite. Well, Mike, one of the best television shows I've seen, and I'm still debating if it's one or two, is this new show on Hulu done by FX. It's an eight-episode series called The Bear. 25 pounds? No, 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 I ordered 200. What is beef? You still got that meat connected? You can get 12.50 for that on eBay. Boom. You cut vegetables like a bitch. System, system, baby. System, system. This is your brother's house. I was running it fine without you. Why didn't he leave it to you then? So the premise of the bear is about Carmen Carmi Berzato. He's an Italian guy from the from Chicago, but he became the best chef in the world. And this is played by Jeremy Allen White, which is he looks like a blonde version of Al Pacino, who suddenly inherits a failing Italian Chicago sandwich shop from his older brother who killed himself. He, his cousin, and the bad news bears of chefs in the sandwich shop try turning around the failing family shop into a respectable eatery before it goes into bankrupt. This is probably, Mike, the most realistic portrayal of life inside a failing restaurant. If your restaurant is going out of business and you got to do everything to save it, this is what chaos looks like in that setting. To me, this is one of the best TV shows out there. I think that part of what the big topics that you'll notice here is that it's about restaurant trauma, man. It's the trauma that these chefs go through and the culture of that kitchen trauma is so consistent in movies and storytelling in almost every part of the, like, because it's real. It's also about egotism, gentrification, mental health struggles, toxic masculinity and dealing with grief in self-destructive ways, which I thought was the thing that took this from something really good to something really great. And I just really enjoyed the show. It's really well acted. That guy, Jeremy Allen White, man, that, that dude's amazing. And, and the co-actress, a black actress by the name of Sydney Adamu, fantastic. She's a revelation, man. And so I think that these two people are worth watching just for that show. It feels like premium television. It's one of the most intense shows I've also seen. Dude, it's half an hour. Because I think that the intensity is so much. You, There's no way that anyone can see an hour of this straight. So they have to probably roll it back to half an hour because of how intense this is. Now, did you binge it? Did you binge All it? Eight like episodes. In like- I mean, not in one sitting, but it's been, you know, throughout the, the last two weeks or so. And I'd like to make an addendum. I know we did a top 10 list show in the last episode, but I got to include The Bear in there. The Bear is one of the best TV shows I've seen. And it's, you know, the offer might be better from Paramount Plus. But these two shows, man, some of the best shows I've seen. And I hope if you are looking for something unique, interesting, something that's that's just fucking good, 
catch the bear. All right. Is that the quote you gave them? Just fucking good, Jack Rico. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it for this episode of Brown and Black. If you would like to support this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Your help will allow us to be heard by many more people. This episode was edited by Joshua Tirado. You can follow our comments and opinions on at Brown Black Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We'll see you on the next episode of Brown and Black.